I had multiple people come out to be like, so are you like work in security for Trump? I was like, you think I'm secret He's, service? Okay. There's only a couple <laughs> ways to think of that. One of those is that you're so dumb. You think this guy in the gray shirt without a gun is <laughs> secret service. Two, you think they've replaced the secret service with me. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, welcome back to Human Reaction, your source for a weekly commentary on cultural news and politics, where it is our mission to arm you with the tools to fight media misdirection and fight the mono narrative. I did it that time? Yeah. I did it. Sans and, and, Joe. And, and you might notice that Joe's not here. Yeah. He quit the podcast. He was too upset after we disagreed in the skiff last week. No, it's not true. Is that what no, happened? No, yeah, yeah. Joe's yeah Joe left the studio's ours now we all of his equipment minor disagreements we're, so he we're gave stealing up, everything he gave our stuff he moved Notice to the South moths America aren't here too the moths are gone <laughs> Joe left and the moths are gone it's it's crazy he took the goddamn moths with him the mothman is out <laughs> he is the mothman all right what are we doing today uh Dave uh, Kamala Harris goes off mic for 0. 0.03 seconds giving us another clip so That's, yeah she's very she, scripted she does that uh, Kamala also picked your annoying, your annoying political junkie uncle as VP. That guy that makes every barbecue awkward. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean? He is that guy. Um, UK are working on a remake of the Glorious Revolution, <laughs> but it's a woke remake because uh, this time we've said the Catholics in for the globalists. No. It's a history joke. Russell will like it. Okay, so <laughs> Japan. <laughs> That's who we do this for, is Russell. <laughs> <laughs> I do it for my fans. <laughs> Only fans. All right, so uh, J- uh, Japan finally gets the revenge for Hiroshima this week. It's all about the long game. <laughs> just, just, anime, waiting around. just anime and market crashes. Yeah. That's, that's what we got. <laughs> Asymmetric warfare. Uh, RFK Jr. courts the most powerful political faction in America, Liam McCullum. Oh no! He signed on to defend the nice. guard. It's that, actually pretty nice. cool. That's yeah, nice. really exciting. Uh, that's, and in that's the nice he got the Liam. <laughs> he got the Liam. <laughs> the Liam contingency. <laughs> uh, and in the skiff, we're going over the ex boycott lawsuit uh, and uh, the White House operation to suppress news on Hunter Biden, uh, not Hunter Biden, just regular Biden. Uh, his mental decline. So that's it. Nice. And uh, before we get into it, make sure to like, follow, subscribe, hit the notification bell, leave us a review, do whatever the thing is on the platform that you're listening to us. And uh, thank you to our members who uh, actually are kind of the lifeblood of this thing. And if you wish to find out how to support us, go to humanreactionpod.com and you can see all the benefits and everything that we can give for you. Because like like Dave said, we also have like a whole other episode that we do here that's just for the members only. And uh, also... Join our Discord, where we post dank memes and talk about the news. Uh, this meme came in from Sam, which I just loved. It's hilarious. It's uh, it's a picture of all those like Fed agents, <laughs> like looking super like Fed boys, <laughs> and it says homophobic, the completely rational fear that one or all of your friends is a federal agent spying on you. <laughs> and we all know that's Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, check out the link in the description for all of our stuff. And now let's go into Kamala Harris on the campaign trail. If you are a small business owner looking for exponential growth, you have to connect with Adam Thune at Intellectual Patriots. He will revolutionize your business game and help you get to the next level. Adam can streamline your business practices and advertising strategies to improve your bottom line. His expertise in data engineering means he can build you the systems you need to collect and analyze market data. His mission is to provide you with invaluable insights to fuel your success. From grant writing and business proposals to digital systems integrations, even AI management, Intellectual Patriots is a one-stop shop for cutting-edge solutions. Don't wait another second. Visit intelpatriots.com to learn more. That's I-N-T-E-L patriots.com. This episode is brought to you by Revved Up Promo, the official apparel partner of Human Reaction. Revved Up is a premier full-service shop specializing in laser engraving, screen printing, and embroidery. Not only are they now making all of our apparel right down the road from us, they can do the same for your brand and ship it to you anywhere in the world. Revved Up helps you navigate the extensive universe of merch options and uses state-of-the-art techniques to showcase your brand in its very best light. So if you want to support our show and our generous sponsor, you can now do so by buying our merch and by turning to Revved Up promo for your own custom apparel needs. Reach them at revduppromo.com. That's with two V's and two P's, or just check the show notes for a link. 
Yeah, so Kamala had... Do we have a, to? A great... We, I'm sorry, Bennett. We have to. I know the Fed boys don't want us talking about this, Bennett, but we got to. Uh, so one of the things that has been interesting is as a new candidate-ish, it's kind of weird to talk about how to how to frame her. Um, <laughs> yeah, what is she? She hasn't been voted for on in pri- any primaries. <laughs> she, she, she has approximately <laughs> zero votes. <laughs> yeah. She she got literally zero votes in the um, in the 2020 primary. Right, right. She actually she never made it to Iowa. Right. So, so it, it, but but she has gotten very few actual moments speaking without a script. It, there's been a lot of campaign rallies, speeches, stuff like that. And very short media segments, but nothing really sit down long form, 60 seconds type stuff. And so she's good. Yeah. She's good scripted. Like I will give yeah. her that. I've listened to two of her like long form speeches, long form. They're not like Trump rallies where they're two hours. They're like 20 to 30 minutes, yeah, right. <laughs> but, but like on a script, she's like pretty good. High energy, all this stuff. Right. But then when she gets off script is where all the gaffes come like, and that's just where it's just fodder for uh, Bennett on the soundboard over there. <laughs> but uh, here's her, uh, one of her recent ones that's kind of been going viral. You know, we have to stay woke. Like everybody needs to be woke. <laughs> and, and, and you can talk about if you're the wokest or woker, but just stay more woke than less woke. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the lady on have, the right, the, just the, mute it real quick. Just mute it real quick and just watch her. Yeah. Just watch the lady on the right. She's like, Ugh. she's like, this is awkward. I guess I better smile. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What was she going for there? Was she actually thinking that woke means like to be awake or what? Did she think woke is like a mainstream issue? Like It, it is a funny thing because before what woke has commonly be, been used as, I used to use the term woke all the Me time too. for being kind of like, awake to you know the media is lying to you you the know the federal like, reserve yeah like, like the that, federal yeah. reserve and just kind of like oh everything's about like money and market manipulation and oil and the wars and all that stuff and that used to be like yeah that's woke because you're not like in with the official narrative that cnn gives you right, right? right. now it's just like you're cool with trans yeah, like, you, you, <laughs> like really you, you want to give hormone blockers to kids like that's woke <laughs> yeah, i guess really into trans um yes yeah, so I, I don't know I, I mean she obviously is courting the you know the radical left side which is what is woke now so like i think she's just using that lingo well, right? she shouldn't be she's in a general election i know, I know her primary is not done yet but she shouldn't be talking like that <laughs> what she should be saying is it was crazy some people think you know this crazy stuff on the far left right that's actually the role you should be taking in august you know like that's an august role like you don't be running to the left in august well, well that's, that's way the, too close to november well that's the weird thing too is her uh she picked her vp pick this week and he is very radical left just like in his general issues like all of his main issues that he has been he is one of those governors that was like very radical yeah, in comparison to you know other democratic governors it's interesting how it was covered by the media before we kind of keep up the first thing which was <laughs> it was like well he's a white dude so obviously he's like more moderate like it's like yeah, he's not no <laughs> d he's not no dei hire <laughs> <laughs> it was like it was like what are we saying right now like what is the underlying implication of this strange rhetoric around this well and yeah that's the thing here is like so they Oh, kind of launched phone. this with this very great video, I, Wait. I must say. Okay, so since we don't have Joe to check the fit, um, let's bet how many glasses of wine did she have before this? <laughs> <laughs> Joe does like a good pants. She does. Look, okay, so to be clear, I, I, I work with a lot of drunk people, and you can tell someone's really drunk by how they use their phone. They, they look at it like it's like an alien device. They're like, I've never seen this before. AI is this funny thing. <laughs> <laughs> I try to do that while someone trying to give you instructions to their house. Yeah, that's <laughs> well. Here's yeah. So here's come here's like kind of like the announcement video that they did. And Very impromptu. It's yeah. very impromptu, very organic and natural. They yeah. are definitely human beings. <laughs> Hi, this is Tim. Oh, Jesus Christ. It's Kamala Harris. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Madam Vice President. Listen, I want you to do this with me. Let's let's do this together. Would you be my running mate and let's get this thing on the road? I would be honored, Madam Vice President. Uh, the joy that you're bringing back to the country, the enthusiasm that's out there, uh, 
It'll be a privilege to take this with you across the country. Well, let me tell you, I have just the utmost respect for you. I have really enjoyed our work together. You understand our country. You have dedicated yourself to our country in, in so many different and beautiful ways. Telescope behind her. This. It's we're like space is one of these <laughs> crazy we're things. We're all in space. And remind everyone <laughs> that we are fighting for the future for everyone. So let's get out there and get this done, okay? Oh, let's do it. Do the work in front of us. Let's win this thing. That's right. All right, buddy. I'll see you That's soon. Right. Take care. Thank you. Okay. That's right. I also hate <laughs> that she called him buddy. Like hey, that. buddy. <laughs> <laughs> that re- I don't know why. That just really irked me. I know, that, I know I'm really <laughs> nitpicking. <laughs> I'm fully aware of this, but it's just like, it seems so not her. And, mm. you know, the, chame- artificial? the chameleon effect <laughs> that she's... Wait, you guys are saying that was all artificial? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine, like, you did a lot of drugs in the 60s, and you're hanging on. But you're the biggest voting, bo- voting block in America, and you've been a Democrat for all these years, and you watch that, and you're like... Oh wow! I can't believe they had cameras on both sides. That's what a crazy coincidence. <laughs> <Dude, laughs> yeah. How what convenient! How, how convenient was it that they both had camera crews next to them when they made this phone call? It's crazy. I mean, it's obviously impromptu. <laughs> Look, he's wearing shorts. If he wasn't, if it wasn't <laughs> that, he'd be wearing a suit. Look at that camo. <laughs> Look at that camo baseball hat. He's just like he's just like one of us. <laughs> he's like one of us. <laughs> You're right. You're right. It's so contrived. It's uh, all yeah. but, but what is it? Wolf of Wall Street? One of yeah. us. Yeah. One yeah. of us. Yeah. Well, it, but it's the same thing because just like a week earlier, uh, there was a they did the same type of video with Obama endorsing her. Yeah, right. where it's like Kamala, we I, I'm proud to say that I'm endorsing you. <laughs> you're just like that's actually not a bad Obama impression. See, you can Are watch. You sure, that wasn't Shapiro. I had eight years of it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys seen the Shapiro thing where he basically t- not Ben Shapiro? I forget the Pennsylvania. Josh. Cover. Yeah, he, yeah. He, his voice cadence is copying Obama, basically. Oh, no, no, really? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. It, it's one of those, you know, it, it is funny because like there was a lot of drama that just kind of came with like the walls versus Shapiro stuff. And it was just like the, the online drama around it was kind of funny. But like it, it, it is interesting that they chose this guy because uh, and we'll get into why that is. He's got some baggage i would say just that doesn't work i think with the middle america like a uh, lot of his issues well i but. think they picked him for middle america but yeah let's get into it let's get into yeah. uh, uh, uh steel obviously we're, we're struggling to give this guy a fair hearing so so we're gonna have abc, ABC do it. We'll let ABC <laughs> give him uh, his bio Tim Walls, a man with deep Midwestern roots and a resume that goes beyond politics Walls came from humble beginnings he was raised in a small nebraska town After high school, he enlisted in the Army National Guard, where he would spend more than two decades rising to the rank of Command Sergeant Major. He went on to become a high school social studies teacher and a football coach. He turned to public service in 2007 and served six terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. Walls has the distinction of being the highest ranking enlisted soldier ever to serve in Congress. He was a member of several congressional committees, including becoming the top Democrat on the Veterans Affairs Committee, where he fought for improved health care for veterans. Walls left Congress to become governor of Minnesota in 2019. He has navigated the COVID-19 pandemic and the public outcry following the murder of George Floyd by a white police officer. This year, he dedicated May 25th as George Floyd Remembrance Day. While Walls isn't well known nationally, the 60-year-old has recently gained notoriety for his candid and direct approach especially in his attacks on GOP vice presidential nominee, J.D. Vance. The things that make small towns work, this was not in hillbilly elegy. It should be. Mind your own damn business. That's how small towns work. Walls has had social media buzzing over his use of the word weird when describing Donald Trump. Well, it's true. These guys are just it weird. Is. And, and it is. you know, they're running for He-Man Women Haters Club or something. That's what they go at. That's not what people are interested in. Now Walls hits the campaign trail with Vice President Harris. The pair will kick off visits to key battleground states, starting with a stop in Philadelphia. Right. There you so go. That is his kind of steel man bio is that what we're going to call it or just like yeah. this kind of more neutral bio it does give him uh i think unfairly glowing reviews of his comments like i think they landed for the left but i don't think like middle of america was like whoa you know like it didn't it was just terminally online people yeah well and he um 
he uh, and Kamala have now kind of hit the rallies and they had one quite big rally that I believe had like 50,000 people at it in Philadelphia. I believe it was in Philadelphia. Well, yeah. that was and this when is he was the, announced, right? Yeah, this, this was kind of was the, the opening rally. salvo of sorts. And this is what actually set a lot of the dialogue that we talked about last week. Uh, no, since last week. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it is it is interesting because they're using this as like, look how many people are at this rally, right? But it, it is kind of like a special rally because it's the announcement. It, yeah. There's a lot of historic moment that exists here. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to compare it to Donald Trump's rallies right now. And because I was watching uh, Trump's like press briefing yesterday and last night. And there was this question. Th- there was a question that was raised from a reporter that was like, how do you feel about Kamala's uh, rally performance? And it was like, okay. And Trump's just like, okay, she had one fifty thousand rally, but then all the others are like 2000 <laughs> and you guys failed to cover my hundred seven thousand one in New Jersey. Right? Like, <laughs> so he's kind of like yeah. playing that, that this is a media spin on the rally size stuff right now. And, you, totally you true. know, but uh, yeah, here, so here's a kind of the highlight from Tim Walls uh, first big speech on the trail. JD Vance, literally literally wrote the foreword for the architect of the Project 2025 agenda. Like, like middle America's like, oh, I totally know what that is. <laughs> like all regular people well, they've been like trained to hate it, right? The JD I still don't know Yale, what it is. Had his career funded by Silicon Valley billionaires and then wrote a bestseller trashing that community. Come on! It's a good That's spin. That's not it's what middle spin. America is. Mm-hmm. And I gotta tell you, I can't wait to debate the guy. And this, they, they did a lot in this rally, did a lot of extended, extended applause. applause. So it was really yeah. kind of that ridiculous. Is if, you, if he's willing to get off the couch and show up. So. <laughs> Now, hold on, hold on, pause, pause. We need to put in a misinformation disclaimer because if that was climate change, you'd have a Wikipedia article that would come out and say, that's false news. But instead, because it's a joke on the left, misinformation is totally fine. Yeah, and we're going to come back around to that. But yeah, obviously, he's more than willing to deal with it. It is a funny joke. It, it is a funny it, joke. It's a funny joke for the for the meme culture, right? Oh, they're trying to meme their way into the presidency. Like, the left is trying to meme. The, the, I mean, the, they're the, trying to get their grips on it. I think that the left is getting better at I was memeing. just going to say, they're, Cause, they're improving. Yeah, because I, I think good memeing culture is tends to be come from the outside. It usually comes from the fringes. And as things are starting to (laughs) as things are starting to (laughs) shift more rightward right now, I I suspect that the meme culture of the right is going to become more lazy and the meme culture of the left is going to start to become dominant. Like I I just suspect that's going to be the case. Well, there's an interesting meme going around up for him. (laughs) Yeah, we can talk about if we want, but it's it's not in the notes, brother. I was planning on not talking about that. Yeah, that's fine. Well, what Bennett is referencing, (laughs) now I feel like we have to reference it. He's just going to force it. Just just forcing it like... I, I don't Does know he own a stable. I don't know. <laughs> the, I don't know the relevancy of it, but I saw something. It was like an AP fact check that was saying something along the lines of like walls in college was hospitalized for consuming too much semen. And then the AP fact check said, and I don't know if this is Photoshop or not. It could be. It very I well feel could like be. it has to be. I feel like it has to be, but I kind of don't want it to be. I don't want it to be either, <laughs> um, but, but the, it's the, like the AP fa- Photoshop or like the AP fact check. I mean, was, uh, it was not human semen. It was horse semen, <laughs> so, which is so a very it, strange thing to say. Yeah, so it didn't say that it didn't happen. It just <laughs> specified which type of semen. But I'm assuming much like the couch thing. Yeah, these are, I, I do think it's fake. These are, uh, you know, memes of the opposing side. Well, and th- if you think about it strategically, one of the things you can do, if someone is unknown, you can say outlandish things about them and it's hard for them to defend themselves mm-hmm. because there's no existing mental model about who they are right so if you said the couch thing about trump people would be like people there's been so many lies about him it's like there's a huge resistance there right um if you you know obama so well you kind of can see what makes sense for who he is from your parable character so there's gonna be a lot of resistance to a change uh such as that he's gay or something like that right um but if you have these other like counter narratives that come up out of nowhere that are hilarious you know from like having sex with a couch or semen that can really dominate you're kind of poison the well on your model about who they are in your head going forward. Also, this uh, the VP debate between him and Vance, it, 
I think is shaping up that it'll be, be pretty interesting. interesting. It'll it be because they're both pretty high energy. They're both like they should just fight. Yeah, they should. They <laughs> should just fight. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I think that's think how that we should well handle. <laughs> I, I, I think we should handle more things like that. <laughs> yeah. But there's also a lot of the stuff because there's a lot of narratives ar- around JD Vance, which is like the hyperbolic statements that he's made about like we're being ruled by cat cat ladies yeah. you know that type of stuff so like there's those things that are going to get thrown out and then there's also wait wait wait, wait. Well, which actually sounds more rural american than this stuff oh yeah yeah right yeah, that is sure. way more how regular people talk internet about... culture says that all the time like yeah. that, that's just that just he's like one with internet culture like that's really all that is mm. like people on the internet say that all the time well, it's just like we're just run by like 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 cat ladies how old is vance i forget uh, he is. He's my age. Yeah, he's yeah, he's, 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 39. Like he's like thirty nine. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's much more internet culture and. He's millennial, yeah, right? He's like, millennial. It's the same thing with, he's got that Vivek millennial vibe, right? And it's not a vibe, like it's just that is the generation. He's existed on social media and the internet and he understands like tech savviness and all this stuff, right? Um, so he's got that. But uh, something that is also interesting here is that Kamala Harris in the polls right now, it's it's looking like a 50-50 race. Yeah, and it does, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I'm a little bit surprised about. I think people who... Um, also they haven't been paying attention or like, wow, she has more support than I would think, given the fact that she just has never received a vote. Right. I mean, like literally, like we said earlier, never gotten a single vote. So why is a excellent question that we haven't really begged yet. And we should probably dig into, I do want to cite, um, uh, Nate Silver was on the Reason podcast, just asking questions, and did a really good job you, you of kind of vetting this from. You can't ask questions. No, no question. No okay. questions. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they're asking questions. Actually, it's a pretty good podcast too. I do. I, That's I the one with it. like Liz and right. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. This, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's uh, uh, in it. Uh, basically, he accounts that look, there is a there's a honeymoon phase like phenomena here, where the Democrats are obviously trying to gin up a lot of support, right? They're trying to manufacture the support. Uh, You can see that with a lot of their internet ops and how they're talking about it. But there's also um, just the fact that, you know, the Democrats have a lot of latent buildup of, you know, there was a point there where 85% of America said Biden was too old, right? And so Democrats were staring down the barrel of like, we're going to freaking lose, (laughs) you know what I mean? And then to have all of that pent up, oh my God, we might lose to Trump again, energy kind of get released uh, and then uh, obviously focus towards Kambala. That's what was kind of explaining this. And, and it is, it's interesting. There was a poll that they cited that broke down demographically by party, uh, whether or not you felt were uncomfortable with, um, well, what you felt like was more important, supporting Kamala Harris to uh, make sure she beats Trump or make sure you have a democratic process in your primary. <laughs> and it was like only Republicans thought it was kind of important to have a democratic process in your primary. Very weird. And all the Democrats were like, no, oh, it doesn't matter. Don't care as long as you beat Trump. So that, that kind of gives you a picture of why this is kind of sparking. And then additionally that, uh, one other side of that, and this is something that, you know, we, wa- we, we oftentimes meme on Trump and we, you know, we, we do criticize him. We criticize him somewhat regularly uh, and hold him to account to his own statements and to what we think. But we also we also are more generous with, you know, his um, failings, I guess, or bad public persona in some ways than maybe some other media outlets and mainstream consumption. And when you look at that and you look at the general public support or, you know, problems with Trump, there are flaws to him as a candidate that do count with those people. They don't count with us very much because we don't we're nerds and we're online and we are really involved in this stuff. But for much more casual media consumers, uh, he is he has a much more complicated picture. And so his his even and and additionally that and one more I got to I got to hit on this because it is so such a mind blow. Um, We only covered the fact that he got shot for a week, one goddamn week. And that's huge when it comes to people's understanding of what's really important, what the narrative of the country is, right? They tried to shoot the guy in the fucking face and we talked about it for a singular week and then we're done. Well, right? And I think a, a lot of that too is because because it was just a graze, it's like, you know, he doesn't have like a, like a lasting injury right, or right, anything right. like that. If it was that, improper, so he's like, I've come out scarred. You know, then we'd be like, oh yeah, we got to talk about this for but, a minute but more. But no. also we, 
we also know when like obviously if it was a democratic establishment figure even if it was like a republican establishment figure like if it was an establishment if it was figure, john mccain yeah oh yeah we're yeah. talking about forever it'd be like he was a war hero then he's a war hero now yeah. like, it would be, yeah. Yeah, it'd be that type of a thing right yeah and i think um, we will return to it it will cycle back through i mean the trump campaign will bring it up eventually we'll have to if it stays close like this um but what we might be seeing is the peak of kamala or we might be seeing the start of kamala it, it's really unclear about what it is Simply, and this is not because Kamala Harris is so talented of a politician in many ways. It's because she has the media really running interference well, uh, by not by not doing their job, by not saying, "Hey, how about an interview?" <laughs> you know, like like an actual interview, like an actual like sit down and tell us what you think about public policy things in a contemporaneous way, right? Not rather than a prescripted way. You know, I, I was looking at a poll, and I don't remember who did this poll. I think it was CNBC. They were reporting on it. And it was putting out like, uh, you, you know, it's, it's the typical like, what are your primary views? And then like, how does this affect your your view on which candidate you want to have? And it was one of those things where, you know, the vast majority of America thinks that their pocketbooks would be better under Trump. Um, but then you had like a large contingency of, ma- of, of America being like, that doesn't matter to me. <laughs> it, like, like, it, it's just kind of like, a, like, how important is that even in this inflationary time? That's but crazy. then you also have like, how important is protecting our democracy to you? And mm. it's like, that was like very high specifically with like women and you know, and mm-hmm. it becomes one of those things where you're like, yeah, there's just a lot of people have different values when it comes to politics. And also a lot of it is just affected. Where are you getting, where are you passively getting your news from? And that becomes the entire thing. Cause that shapes which camp you end up being. And it's just like, where is your passive news consumption? Which part of that culture are you in? Right. And to be clear, have you ever seen the internet meme of the guy going around saying, Hey, do you want to sign this petition to end women's suffrage? <laughs> like that's the people who say like, I'm really concerned about our democracy. <laughs> so I'm going to vote for the candidate that has zero goddamn votes ever. Like other than running for Senate, right. It's since she became a national figure. Well, it's also like, uh, I don't have, I don't have it queued up, but you had JD Vance, uh, going up to, uh, her plane on the tarmac and, and going up to a bunch of the journalists, being like, hey, uh, how you guys doing, right? <laughs> like, and he did this whole thing, like, you know, Kamala hasn't spoken with any of you guys. You guys gotten any questions? <laughs> <ever? Like, laughs> well, and and you think that would be a more mainstream viral? It went viral on the right, but it didn't really on escape X, that. Right? Yeah, right. Like, like it'll be on X. Like, if you get your, it, a lot of the election is, do you get your news from X or not? Mm-hmm. Like that, that becomes, and it, that also kind of tells you how. In how into propaganda narratives are you? Because a lot of these things, like you can fall into various misinformation kind of propaganda narratives on X, but there's a lot we'll much more. Later. There's a lot more. Much there's much more like resistance and constant uh, back and forth that's happening yeah. where a lot of people get bought into something and then they fall out of it because there's all this. There's this constant information flow on X. Where if you're just getting your news from say like a very specific corporate media outlet or, you know, something like that, or just like a one singular podcast or, or whatever, yeah. it becomes kind of more of this, like people aren't correcting their mistakes on those. So you just kind of get bought into whatever the narrative of that one singular outlet that you go to right. is. Right. And that's why if you only listen to this podcast, that's the exception to the rule. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is the one. Yeah. we always correct ourselves. I just, I will just, uh, I will, I'm just going to continue my brainwashing on our small audience. <laughs> and, and, and one more thing. Yeah. And one more thing. Uh, was I right in my prediction? Do you guys remember my prediction? I It'd be someone from the East or the Midwest or yeah. the South. It oh yeah. Be Cause we were talking about Coast. how she gets the Hollywood elite kind yeah. of California yeah, yeah. Democrats. And, and, right? and I was maybe a little, I was maybe a little mo- leaning a little bit more towards Shapiro, but mm-hmm. I think most people in my position looking at it thought Shapiro was the more rational option. Uh, but she went with walls and I think for also rational options, just different ones and more electoral uh, in some ways. And I, we covered this, but it's, it's the narrative you can ca- ca- carry and the money you have access to. And he's a little bit more narrative than money that said, and that might be because she's inherited all the Biden money from the East coast. So she really doesn't need it, which maybe I underweighed that. So uh, let, let's get into some of these. Uh, there's been kind of a lot of criticisms of him that have and been this circulating. Is the, this is the big one. And this one's pretty big. This one's pretty big. <laughs> so uh, uh, to cue this up, there's been a uh, stolen valor accusation that's been going on about his actual military record uh, during the global war on terror. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of coming under deep scrutiny. So we'll start off with uh, this video here. Military background? I spent 24 years in the National Guard, some of that full time. I was an artilleryman. I deployed in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. My battalion provided um, 
base security throughout the European theater from Turkey to England um, in the early stages of the war in Afghanistan. And that same battalion is now in Iraq at this time. Terry, background? So Operation uh, Enduring Freedom, uh, just to um, kind of remind everybody, in response to the 9-11, uh, terrorist attacks had killed nearly 2,000 people. Operation Enduring Freedom officially began on October 7th of 2001. Um, with the bombing of al-qaeda and taliban forces in afghanistan so what he's talking about is our operations going into afghanistan uh you, you know what's funny is there's a uh bloomberg did a stealth edit here um notice the difference between these two images here Oof. <laughs> Oof, that's a mistake <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, are those not similar country <laughs> iraq and italy are pretty close uh, so it, it says it's uh, just a typo guys in, in, this, what you're in this article about. it says uh, at the time the iraq war was ongoing and going badly and he stood out as a command sergeant major walls uh, a 24 year old veteran of the american national guard recently returning from serving in italy as part of the operation enduring freedom um and then there's the stealth at it that is uh, iraq <laughs> and so the real the real controversy here is that claim that he was that he was in iraq or in afghanistan and doing this sort of thing and it's obviously kind of blurring the lines with his rhetoric there um and what we have and this is a this is a really excellent reporting uh, and i actually i actually never figured out what news agency it was i don't know what that a is in the bottom left hand corner there i don't know if you guys recognize it mm, I don't know. um but it, it is uh, they actually interviewed uh the guy who replaced him in his uh, uh in his unit uh for the invasion of iraq not just hanging out in italy Oh, oh, yeah. And here is uh, the video. In a way, he's back again to wage a public war of words against Tim Walls. He, he abandoned us. You know, I mean, what the hell kind of leader does that? I mean, he just as soon as the shots were fired in Iraq, he turned and ran the other way and hung his hat up and quit. We'll get to Barron's new message for voters in a moment. But this all starts years earlier when Barron says Wall's misleading statements about his military service first led him to come forward in the fall of 2018. So you try to get this message out, but Minnesota's largest newspaper checks it out, says it's 100 percent true, but yet refuses to print. When I hung the phone up, I said, what the hell is this, North Korea? Back in 2005, a warning order went out to the 1st Battalion, 125th Field Artillery to mobilize for a mission to Iraq. At the time, Walls served as the unit's highest non-commissioned officer. But months later, Walls would retire from the Guard, avoid the deployment, and run for Congress. Tom Behrens was next in line for the position and was asked to take his place. I was like, well, for Pete's sake, if this guy quit. And if I say I'm not going to do it, I mean, what the hell kind of leadership is that? If a company would say that we're going to deploy to Iraq or somewhere and you're going to be gone for whatever amount of time. And then the foreman just says, no, I'm not going. I mean, what does that say to the 500 people that work in that factory? Barron's would go on to serve in Iraq on a nearly two year deployment as a command sergeant major. All well walls began using that title as a congressman. Barron says he first contacted walls with his concerns, sending these letters to Washington. They all went unanswered. But then we fast forward to the wow. election. Yeah. Wow. So uh, Walls runs for Congress, is a congressman, then returns and runs for governor, right? So part of that is this, and it's been like this constant pressure that they've been trying to manage, ignore, as he continues from then to today to make statements that kind of skirt that line of indicating or at least misleading someone who might not be familiar with the underlying you know, issue that he was a combat veteran, not simply someone who served his country, which is a good thing, who, uh, who, you know, was part of the infrastructure for protecting Europe or, you know, that sort of thing, but then kind of indicating as if he actually went to Afghanistan or to Iraq. Uh, what's this video here? I haven't, I haven't watched this video. Oh, uh, this... Actually, I'll just kind of summarize it as you, oh. as you go over it. But I think this is really fascinating too. This is actually, uh, uh some time ago, uh, back when he was still a congressman, of uh, a, a bunch of vets who showed up oh, at his office uh, to confront uh, the staff about this very issue and talk about it. And it's it, this is one of those ones that should go very viral. It's like a very compelling uh, story as the these you know these vets who served with him go show up in his office and say, "Hey, he didn't do this." And they go like, well, I kind of felt like it was, no, 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 he didn't do this. You don't understand. Like he left before we actually saw any, you know, infield uh, uh, combat um, 
uh, in, a, in an actual war zone. So it's a thing where like, if you know Minnesota politics, this is probably like a pretty common criticism that has been laid out against him for a long time, mm-hmm. not just as governor, but also his congressional stuff. Like this would be something that's probably come up in like congressional campaigns right. and all this stuff. Right. And it's a spike dude. Like mm-hmm. if this actually does get out, when the ads start rolling, when the paid media starts rolling out and calling him saying he has, you know, the stolen valor problem, it's going to be a it's going to be a devastating uh, hit for a lot of the people that he's supposedly the guy who's going to be bringing in for them, which is rural America, which has a very high service rate, which is much more likely to really care about this issue. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's yeah, that's pretty. That's a pretty big one, like right out the gate for this all of a sudden to just be the thing. And this is just going to continue to fester and brew probably over a long period of time. Like they're going to and I've seen J.D. Vance is really targeting that like jd vance is running this like shadow campaign right now where he's just like following (laughs) wherever they're going it's kind of funny it'll be really great when he puts on a banana suit he's like debate me otherwise you're a banana or something like that (laughs) that's a very common campaign thing you've like put someone in a chicken suit or whatever and so additionally you know right off the bat he also gets on to live media for an interview and makes like a complete constitutional gaffe like in this this went big online but it really needs to be heard I think we need to push back on this. There, there's no guarantee to free speech on misinformation or, or hate speech, and especially around our democracy. I- to be clear, a kid was our like democracy. lost his identity online and was like put in front of like a what, tribunal. What, what is this? What is this referencing? What for is a meme? Event? What is the event that? Oh, was this the meme? The, no, 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 the no, meme guy. I, I don't remember job. exactly what the what he's actually referencing here, but I'm just saying this is the same guy who was. That happened. Like we had a moment where we were like so worried about misinformation, then all that kind of stuff that the left made it their identity to oppose free speech. And this guy's like continuing it. This is the same guy who made the joke about J.D. Vance and the couch, which is literal misinformation. Like it's an intentional lie to like, you know, paint this guy as a, I don't know, sexual freak, I guess as a weirdo. And he's engaging in this rhetoric while saying there's no guarantee well, well, in the Constitution well, that that's protected horse speech. Semen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this guy's I don't, guzzling. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just repeating what I saw online. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so is he. So, yeah, right? so if, it's if, fine. If that's the rules Misinformation of the game, on X is just terrible. <laughs> as is typical, he's whenever it's convenient, misinformation's a major problem when the plebs do it. But when I do it, it's a funny joke and everyone should just go along. Well, and that's the common thing is, you know, misinformation only matters if it if it hurts your narrative. It, it doesn't matter if you need your narrative enforced. It's OK to use misinformation like this is the this is how it works. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is people are not people have these double standards and it's it's going to continue to be that way. And you just kind of got to be able to pick it apart when right? you have to wonder, like how strong their coalition is, especially their left flank at this moment. Right. So they picked a guy who is, you know, has done. I mean, as a congressman was more moderate, became governor, obviously picked up on the 2020 moment and became very liberal over mm-hmm. that time period and passed a lot of little policies. It was funny. Uh, I met someone from Minnesota and I asked him, like, what do you, what do you think of Walls? And, you know, her only memory was like, oh, he did like free school lunches. Yeah, I've for seen kids. that. Like, yeah, that I've was that. it. It wasn't I, the I've George the Floyd Roberts, it, yeah. ro- uh, riots. It wasn't his, you know, service in the military. It was it that? That's what stood out, right? So, but the, you got to wonder about that center left coalition and, and does it, him as a candidate spark uh, a good, um, uh, uh, kind of alignment with that. And so one of the things is uh, we had this Axios report about his stance on Gaza. And I think this is this is a niche issue for the left that really matters in the left coalition, mm-hmm. but doesn't matter that much to average Americans who place the Israel-Palestine war very low on their issue priority list, um, if they know anything about it at all. Uh, and that is uh, this, the top line really does it. Some Democrats push Kamala Harris to pick Tim Waltz over Pennsylvania Governor uh, Josh Shapiro because of words of Shapiro's position on the Israel Hamas war. That said, Walls' st- stance, uh, stance on Israel's um, are largely similar to those of other Democrats, right? He's kind of in the mainstream. And in fact, he's very similar to Kamala, which is say to the left anything they want to hear about how it's genocide and then basically fund Israel at the exact same time. Mm-hmm. The real shame, and this is why it's got to really suck to be kind of a normie leftist right now. If you're like, if you're a good leftist, if you're Glenn Greenwald, you see this stuff coming. If you're, I don't know, what's the guy's name? Bloomberg? 
He runs the uh, yeah um, gray zone. Gray zone. If you see this coming, you're like, oh, these guys are not real, really in our camp. But if you actually thought that you had a people in your camp, uh, it doesn't look like it. It looks like you are alone. In fact, all your all your heroes, like AOC and members of the squad, they're going around saying how great this is and how important it is we elect a woman. They're not prioritizing this issue at all. They've they've given up on you. Well, yeah, and and those quote unquote good leftists like they're just they're not in the camp anymore like the 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 bloomberg the jimmy door it's almost the, hard the, to, the schellenberger yes. like like they're, they're they're a different thing now the glenn greenwald right like it's almost hard like, to map them now right it's like where are they where are they well it's just right? like the traditional right versus left paradigm has broken and has it has been broken for a long time and we've just been in this transitionary period as everything's realigning themselves right mm-hmm. like like we're in a new era of politics the old century is over we're now in a new era and it seems like what what it feels to me is that we're kind of in what future history will probably call like it, it, it'll look back on this time period kind of similar to the progressive era mm-hmm. where I think we're moving into a new thing and like right now we're getting our like Teddy Roosevelt's and our Woodrow Wilson's and uh, who I think are actually right wing now like mm-hmm. like like the the people that define the next century I think are a lot of the new people on the right that are coming up and Trump has been kind of that transitionary figure in that right mm-hmm. now right that- and, and, and then the future will be like the millennials people like JD Vance, people like Vivek, people like Tulsi Gabbard. They're kind of like the new, and then the media figures like Glenn Greenwald, like Schellenberger, like, you know, all these people, they are this new formulation of whatever this next thing is. Right. That's an interesting theory. But that said, the seating arrangement in the French parliament two centuries ago is a really useful model. It is a how, useful on, model. How to understand true. everything in politics forever. <laughs> it, it is true. And, and <laughs> our politics are defined by the, the seating model of the French. And then also what happened in the forties. <laughs> like, that, that's like, it. That is totally our entire matters. political structure is, is that. Does that make any sense to you, Bennett at all? <laughs> No, <laughs> not the not the seating one. That's where the it, left I, right thing. Left right yeah, comes, yeah. All of me. I mean, that's comes what from I, France. I figured, but I was they were like trying to visualize it. The radical revolutionary sat on the left, and the guys who are like, maybe we shouldn't cut off everyone's head. Sat on the right. That was the. It, it's literally just they segregated Congress <laughs> by a seating arrangement, and we're like, that's how politics works. <laughs> that's the that's whole it. thing. That's it. It's kind every of country has to be that way now. It's actually a good demonstration <laughs> of memes, but yeah. So uh, it's oh, what is it? It's like uh, what's a what's the kind of. Uh, in in uh, evolutionary biology, there's that one kind of creature that just doesn't change because it has such a great ecological... Crocodiles are a good mm-hmm. example. Or great white sharks. Yeah, great white sharks. Forever, they don't change, right? This is, a, this is the meme example of the great white shark, right? It just doesn't change over time. It's always like an idea space model that just doesn't ever go away, no matter how unuseful it is to really understand. Oh, it. yeah, like, like general political compass theory as a whole is yeah. like that right where yeah. it's like no i think it's a horseshoe and he's like, and he's like no this is all like not this is all like jargony nonsense that is not actually how like it does not really reflect how it works like even the four quadrants like but, it doesn't actually reflect the current political dynamics yeah. at all but sometimes useful to help regular people understand what's going on yeah okay so and then we also have and this is this is also demonstrative of um kind of the left-wing spin out of this to kind of prevent the people on the left from really putting any substantial pressure on the Harris campaign to be, you know, to have some allegiance to them. Uh, there was some uh, folks in the crowd protesting Kamala Harris's support of Israel at one of these speeches as, as they were kind of really launching the campaign. And please do check out Project 2025. See, we really keep bringing that up. Like, I'm telling you. It's like Agenda it 21 a for, for lefties. It is a plan to weaken America's middle class. Project 2025, if he is elected. So you can kind of hear them in the background. <laughs> These are right? Palestine protesters in the background. Yeah. So they're getting counter chanted at. It's all good. Turn it down a bit. It's all good. It's all good. I'm here because we believe in democracy. Everyone's voice matters, but I am speaking now. I am speaking now. Yeah, you are. Everyone's voice matters, but I'm speaking now. Interesting. So, Project 2025. (laughs) Look, if he is elected... Donald Trump intends to give tax breaks to billionaires and big corporations. 
He intends to cut Social Security and Medicare. He intends to surrender our fight against the climate crisis. And he intends to end... You get the point. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You gotta get to, I'm speaking now. She hasn't done it yet. She, 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 she's still she, getting interrupted. She did it already. The Affordable already? Care Act. You know what? If no. you want Donald Sorry. Trump to win, then say that. Otherwise, I'm speaking. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, yeah, now, now pause it. That, that applause goes on forever. Oh, wait. And she gives like the steely this gaze. mug. Steely gaze. Did you see the lady behind her doing like the... the <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, the eyebrow raise. So uh, w- what is interesting there is her argument for why those people are wrong, right? And this, is, this, this actually follows the polling. People care way more about, on the left, on, on the Democrat like base, cares way more about stopping Dem- Donald Trump than the thing that they spent the last 10 months saying is a genocide. They're like, genocide, schminicide. Sh- you know, it's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's all about stopping Donald Trump I now. Know words, <laughs> I had the best words. Well, and that's, that's the thing is, and that's where, and that, that really comes down to like the question here of the, the poll numbers and everything is, um, how much of the voting country, like of people who actually vote, th- their primary issue is we can't have Donald Trump in the White House. Like, th- because that seems to be, there's still a very large swath where that is their entire issue. And that seems to be all the Democrats really have. Mm-hmm. It's like trans stuff and stopping Donald Trump. Like, that's like all they have. And stopping Agenda 2025, which is Trump, right? Yeah. Quote yeah, unquote yeah, Trump. Yeah. yeah. That's, it's, right. it's their Agenda 2021 for, yeah. and it's, it's interesting to the degree to which it's a kind of conspiratorial language to generate support on their, on their side, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if it really reaches out to the middle, and which is, again, interesting because it's August. They moved the Democratic convention way out to August for all kinds of strategic reasons. It feels like they're in, like, January strategy mode right yes, now. Yes, yes. <laughs> right? I mean, and, but it's funny because as that's happening, like, the lower information voters like, oh, okay, Biden's out. So that, that kind of initial anxiety about we have – you know, a weekend to Bernie's situation going on at the White House is now being directed to, oh, f- thank God. Okay, Biden's out, Harris is in, and they've already forgotten about a lot of the other stuff. Well, that that's, the, that's the interesting thing. still there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, but, <laughs> it's like people forget that he's still the president. <laughs> yeah, like people, are, I, I do feel Someone's like... Someone's following him around with the nuclear codes right now. <laughs> yeah. Going like, is he going to stand up? He's got to fall over? Like that guy is wondering. It, it, it does feel like the American public just kind of feels like Kamala's the president right now or yeah. something like that. Or, yeah. Yeah. But it also is the the thing about it, too, is um, like so we've all kind of accepted that Biden is only president in name. Right. Like we've all we've all accepted <laughs> that. And then we're we've like moved on. We're like Kamala is not going to be that way. But it's like, no, Kamala is also a president in name person like if she was to be elected it's the same shadow cabinet that exists around them that she would be a part of she is just an empty vis- vessel and it's clear if you just like watch her throughout the years she has no she doesn't really have that many opinions right like she is somebody that has has just kind of gone with the flow of whichever system she has been a part of over time well, she, she's it's, she it, it's no different whether it's biden or kamala so there, there's different models in the basics of political science around your candidate what is your candidate who's your candidate are they an ideologue are there someone who's there for a mission or are they a messenger because that's kind of you can see think of the same thing as a ceo ceos kind of come in and have very strong visions for the company other ones are just reflections of their board's will and, and are good communicators of where well, the direction the boards want them to go well Those are, that, that's the difference between two good ceos usually you have the startup founder ceo which is like the Elon Musk CEO, or you have the hired by the board and is very restricted by the board because they can also fire him. Yeah, <laughs> right? Like, right. like those are the two. T- and right now we're in the hired by the board and trying to get the DEI uh, inclusion <laughs> stuff. Right. Like that's that's where we're at, where Donald Trump is much more like the Elon Musk CEO of being a president, well, kind of. And right? that's where the DEI hire attack really works is the degree to which if we can if not we if it's possible to really break through the average public to say, hey guys, she actually isn't a politician. She's somebody who's rodent in without any votes ever. And she's just here, right? Like she didn't get in. She got in by an elite strategy to prevent you from voting for a candidate. Yeah, like it, it really is. We are going to install our next puppet now <laughs> and you don't get a say in it. Yeah, like like right. that is the Democratic strategy for the 2024 election. It's just like, well, our old puppet, it's kind of falling apart. Sucks. 
but we're but here's our new democracy. One. Yeah. And, and, we're, and we're preserving <laughs> democracy through it. You you ha- you have to let us install your candidate without voting for her. Otherwise, we can't save democracy. Like that's where that's the state that we're in right now. It's crazy. I love it. It's so ironic and delicious. Uh, I don't have a good cue up for this uh, Schellenberger video. Do you want to do it, Kyle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, basically, Schellenberger put out really what he sees as the three major issues of um, of Tim Walls. He does look. He's very turtle <laughs> he's, he's he's very Steve Jobs in this. He looks good though. Like he looks great. He looks good. Yeah. If you the haven't seen if, if you haven't seen Dave interviewed uh, uh, Schellenberger <laughs> on, on our Twitter um, back at Freedom Fest, but uh, no, yeah, these are the. The three major issues that we see that, and I, I think that he's correct. This is the, uh, this is the proper criticism of Walls, in my opinion. Three major controversies threaten Walts's image as a moderate. First, Walts waited three days before asking for the deployment of the National Guard after Black Lives Matter protests turned into fiery riots, which destroyed hundreds of businesses Mostly in Minneapolis. Two, Waltz created a snitch line through which thousands of Minnesotans reported their neighbors, co-workers, and police officers to the government for things like not wearing masks while outdoors during COVID. And three, Waltz doubled down last year on letting doctors and surgeons give drugs to and operate on children and adolescents who are confused about their gender at a time when Britain and much of the rest of Europe is banning them. Three major... Con- so, mm, so, those, th- so those three things, it's... Uh, BLM riots and his like resistance Snitches. to stopping them yeah. S- snitching on COVID mm-hmm. like which is Oof. that's where we were in 2021 it's very right communist ish it's very yeah. yeah it's like I read the gulag archipelago it's very gulag yeah. archipelago right and then um, and then doubling down on the hormone blockers I, for I, I agree stuff. with everything you said there I'd only add that the stolen valor narrative which I think is going to be another big one going forward yeah I yeah. think this was made before that narrative started popping up too mm-hmm. um, but and just to highlight especially the BLM riots because this is a lot of people are kind of taking trips down memory lane of what that actually looked like in Minnesota. Um, I kind of forgot yeah. how bad it was. This is how bad it was. Oof. Right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now I remember these. Yeah. Like, like people forget what the summer of love actually looked like. Like these were the mostly peaceful protests that mm-hmm. we all meme about. Right. Mm-hmm. Like cities were under fire. They were being destroyed. And Trump was giving the option <laughs> of being like, of being like, do you guys want the National Guard? No, like it's kind of up to the governor's decisions. It's kind of like states' rights, you know, that type of a thing. And he wasn't just going to go in and do it himself because if he did that, he, he would have all of a sudden been called a dictator, right? <laughs> like that was the narrative that was forming was like, Trump's going to come in and stop your peaceful protests because he's a dictator. And then he's just like, okay, governors, you decide. And they're just like, and 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 then we had to like that was the media misinformation around it, right? It was oh, fire. It was so fr- it was so frustrating to. <laughs> to see that um what a strange image especially that one like the the symbolism of that image like the american flag upside down very kind of see through through the yeah yeah you know god damn and yeah. this this was not just in minnesota it was everywhere like it was happening all over in major cities right but you were Yikes. a racist for being against it you can't that's that is not nearly as bad as january 6 i don't know what you guys are talking this, about this yep <laughs> no january 6 was uh the worst the thing. worst thing that's happened in america ever it hopefully was, we said that late enough into the video or it's not gonna be completely suppressed it was uh <laughs> <laughs> it was uh we're, yeah, we're an hour ish jan, jan 6 was the worst thing ever worse than 9 11 worse than the civil war <laughs> it was worse than pearl harbor thanks worse chat gpt <laughs> all right um but yeah so so that's what minnesota looked like at the time but a place that's currently on fire now is london so the protests over the southport stabbings that we reported on last week and just to remind you if you missed it or just a quick uh reminder uh three little girls were stabbed um eight injured children who are in the hospital under care uh and two adults it turned really ugly this week with rioting in many areas around london and major cities 400 people were arrested, um, substantial property damage, uh, including, you know, we'll get into some of that stuff, but hotels where they're hosting migrants, um, say they say some mosques, so I found no like video evidence of that or picture evidence of that in immigration centers. Um, Part of that to kind of get a sense for what's happening on the ground is we still set 
And there's because of, some of this is because of rules around the system, but there's a, a very strange missing of the British media in this. Uh, there was a, a good, uh, pretty substantial delay until the judge uh, ordered the release of a picture of the person who committed the crimes, uh, or at least the who was accused of uh, committing the crime. But we really have, it, it's still this picture of him as a small child, as a y- very young person, which is very interesting because it, We've seen that in America a lot, too. Like, for example, the Trump assassination attempt, we still don't have a contemporary picture of that person. No. Uh, for a long time. No, the, the, the pictures of crooks have been from 16 years old. And remind me, who's the hands up, don't shoot? Uh, that was... Um, uh, Who was that guy? That was the New York one, wasn't it? No, 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 no it was that down south. No, it was a Trayvon Martin. Well, Trayvon, Trayvon Martin, Martin was another example where they released pictures of him as a very young adult even though we're in the age of social media when there's lots of contemporary well, pictures. It was, it was the same thing. Like there was one, one of those ones that happened in the South. Um, we were using all these images of like the, the, the guy from several years before when he was like young teenager looking kind of good. But then we have like video footage of him, like robbing a store right before, yes. like the, he got killed and, he got and all this stuff. Big. Like and he, he got very big head, and right? he was like rough and has a beard and things like that. Right. right. And, and we were sitting here like, Ah, oh, that guy just killed this poor black kid. You yeah, know? but he was like, no, he's like that was like an eight year old picture, and like now he's like robbing stores. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> there's know? like, and and obviously for this for this kid, I mean, he's he's he was actually into kind of acting. He's actually in some videos and stuff like that. But these are all old, right? So it's one of these strange things that keeps happening that you just can't help but notice the trend on and is happening in this London situation. So we also have no real social media analysis. This kid also wasn't apparently online, which is interesting because most well, kids are online. Uh, and, and, and additionally to that, like any known motive, once again, like no known publicly available motive. Why? Well, and that's the thing is like, and this this was traditionally true over the years. Now people are much more online than they were. But if, if you were somebody that was much more of a getting your news online type of person, you tended to be able you tended to see these trends a little bit more easily. But when you talked about those trends, you seemed like a crazy person with like normal people all the time. Like I felt right. this way all the time when when those exact examples of like the black kid down in the south, that stuff when that was happening was like, no, like these are clearly different ages. And like I saw footage of him robbing a store. Right? Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. But then you would talk about it with people. And they're just like, yeah, that seems a little crazy. You think this is like a conspiracy, you know, like, yes. and you're just like, well, I, I, I saw with my own eyes. All I'm doing like, is noticing <laughs> this hands up. Don't shoot was uh, Ferguson, Missouri. And it was, yeah, it was the Ferguson. That, that's what I'm. Yeah. The Ferguson one was is that one where Red House happened. No, that no. was, uh, that was yeah, somewhere, know. somewhere. And else. it was uh, Michael Brown was the <laughs> Michael uh, Brown was, yeah. the, was the name of the guy. Yeah, it was like show. Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown. There's a, a bunch of these, right? Right. Which turned out to be a completely false narrative. That's not important. So the uh, so these these protests, you know, start talking about it. and it's inter- it's an interesting layers of media narrative. What's actually happening on the ground? Obviously, we're not a UK based po- podcast, so we're just observing things from the outside. We're an Irish based podcast. <laughs> we, we don't support the empire. Um, there was a counter uh, um, set of protests that happened from the Muslim community, and additionally to from kind of the left. Including and th- and some of this is you know a reaction to things seen online and some of these are real you know real danger right so we have these kind of patrol the streets sort of things we have these Muslim men uh, running around basically saying hey these are our communities under threat and we're out to protect members of our community uh, from the radical right thugs who are doing all this bad stuff and th- and there were bad things happened to the Muslim community here where Muslims were targeted uh, you can find plenty of videos of you know dudes just sucker punching random brown people in the uk well and here here's um, just like while you're well we're kind of going over it here oh, so. let me turn that down a bunch but like here's some examples but of that also but what these things are looking like but these yeah these these you know from the muslim community protests also went pretty mm-hmm. wild like a, you know burning stuff and um riots and yeah, things like I that i think this would be more of an example of that. That's the more, this is more the patrol one, right? And yeah. the, this is a guy speaking Arabic, walking backwards, talking. And like this, this guy's in a bunch of these videos. Uh, I don't know who he is. I got a, I was planning on trying to figure that out, but is I he a got provocateur to it. of some sorts. Uh, uh, no, I think he's a, he's a Muslim community leader. Um, mm. But it was it, 
there it's it very much plays into the if you notice that dude just holding the bat <laughs> like mm-hmm. people and that's that's you see that on the right as well they're like a lot of people just armed up well i mean th- this this is exactly what the P- blm protest looked like it was this type of stuff right here like it, it looks very similar if we're comparing those right um there was you know many street fights that that broke out there was a guy who is actually a counselor and politician with the labor party who was suspended over a video where he quote urging people to cut throats uh this is this is a video of some muslim protesters who are basically busting up a pub Mm -hmm. Uh, and you get this actually from the other side where a guy just gets swarmed by guys and just beat up on the ground right in front of that kind of covered area right there um so how systemic was this side? It was actually a little bit less systemic. Um, the 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 kind of right wing, you know, was more uh, probably in size. But then the counter left, like the labor organized counter left by a group called Stand Up for Racism, uh, which had all like the same branding. I think it's probably part of the Labor Party. Um, or some kind of like spinoff organization. I'm sure, I'm sure a group called Stand Up Against Racism is probably a very natural, completely not, organic, not, not astroturfed. <laughs> I'm entirely. sure George Soros like has Intel nothing op. to do with him at all. <laughs> it feels, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but what was interesting there is like if you look at a lot of these kind of center right, on the ground citizen journalist types, just people who they're probably interested. They're not like neutral, showing up and saying, "Hey, when we showed up, we thought this was going to be a vigil." And then this other side showed up called Stop Racism. And we're like, dude, we're here just to, you know, to mourn the loss of these young people who lost their lives. What are you protesting against? Who are you protesting against? And they are obviously hurling, you know, accusations that these people are racist. And if you look at the comments of those videos, these, it looks really bad, dude. You got people in the comments saying, Hey man, you know, if you're, I, I just wanted to protest these, you know, I just wanted to protest the loss of innocent life. And now you're calling me a racist. Well, I guess I'm a racist then you're all the same to me now, right? Like this is just the, the temperature is just getting dialed mm-hmm. up in a really gross, disgusting way. Well, and it's exactly, it's, it's how so much of the stuff in America over the last decade has gone where you end up having these events where you just have like normal people going and doing a thing. And then there's like another group that shows up and starts instigating a bunch of things. And it's like, well, now all of a sudden, <laughs> January 6th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we'll get into yeah, that. There, I think there's those, some right? agent provocateur evidence and it's probably some of the best agent provocateur evidence we have since January 6th really? of this tactic. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, the, the big thing that kind of spun out of this is that I want to break into a couple different narratives. Uh, one of them being a two tier policing narrative, which is interesting, especially from us on the left or on the, in a, not on the left <laughs> in America, Our the way we think of two tier policing <laughs> and the way that the kind of mainstream of Britain has been talking about two tier policing, which you really have to watch about claims on this because there's been, so there's a lot of like shenanigans going on here is this this Guardian article about uh, England writes how, quote, two-tier policing myth became, how, how has the two-tier myth became so widespread? Um, this is an interesting thing because it's a flipping of the narrative, right? Two-tier policing has been covered by the Guardian many, many times, but obviously it was in the direction of how the how racist the cops were, right? It was a, it's a very familiar narrative we can recognize in the United States where they have been saying that the two-tier policing is that the police are racist. They pull over people who are dark-skinned more than they do people who are light-skinned. Um, the idea has been propagated by Tommy Robinson and others from far right, but claim does not stand up to scrutiny. Yeah, and, and there's there's a case there, right, in the statistics that you can release about police stoppage and stuff like that. It doesn't it doesn't break down that obviously whites are more that way. That said, it isn't that the the people on the right who are talking about this have no evidence. There are substantial anecdotal evidence, especially of how the police handled the protests, where you can find a video of a police officer going up to the going up to the Muslim group with a translator to say, hey, guys, if you have any weapons, leave them at the mosque. <laughs> when you had the same thing of elderly people, like elderly, you know, I don't know what the word to say, native English, white people uh, being arrested. And this is one of this older lady. Oh, I, th- I think this is it right here, right? Yeah, uh, being arrested. I've got a pacemaker. I've got a pacemaker. I've got a pacemaker. 
and they've just arrested me for walking up here. No, to reach for section 35. Oh, because they're left. You want to do them any tighter? Oh, that's why I'm trying to lock them so they can stop getting tight. Well, actually, you're really right. tight in them. Well, I'm not. You're really you really are tight in them and you're really a making me. You're what? So can you relax? You're what? You're joking. You just relax, I'm arresting you. I've been arrested in my life. Madam. I have. Don't you, miss. Don't you. I have never been arrested in my life. I'm 73 years old. And I have come here because of them babies who's died. And I am being arrested. Yeah, so that, that, that line right there. I'm coming here because those babies that died. And that's and that's a thing that's happening. And then that's creating its own backlash of people being like, what's going on here? Like, I showed up to a vigil and I wanted to protest this this absurdity of uh, this problem in our, in our social order. I don't know what we're yelling about! <laughs> and, and now... <laughs> I'm that's getting exactly arrested. <laughs> she's just like, what is happening? Yeah, right. And it's the most British arrest ever, just to tease the British a little bit. There's this old guy, and he's literally like, uh, could you uh, tell me so what I'm being arrested for? You know, like, like, as he's I in was, handcuffs. I was like, so obviously weird. she was raising her voice, but I was like, this is like the most polite arrest I've ever <laughs> seen. Especially compared to America. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be like in Canada, like, what is this all about? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and it reminds me, I think this was in the UK. There was a bit of a viral clip from like a week or two ago of someone getting uh, um, arrested for Facebook posts. And there was like two officers that came to his house. And I'm pretty sure it was a UK guy. I might be wrong about that. But it was just like two officers coming to his house and being like, well, you said some things online. And I think like, you're right. Like yeah. Facebook this, this posts familiar. and stuff. Yeah. I remember making fun of it, actually. I remember yeah. doing that. Like, look here, bud. I can post what I want online. It was like very much that. Um, yeah. So Starmer is the the new prime minister. Um, he's left labor guy. Um and the, the, it was interesting and the immediate response from the internet was like, there's a definitely a double standard that we're working with here, which does su suggest the two tier policing narrative of how they're orientated to the global narrative about racism and policing versus this situation of, it's hard to say this because it isn't exactly true white. It's more like Christian and been here longer than the Muslim wave, right? Cause there's, there's quite a few, black people also in these crowds um, and Indians who are also in these crowds. And there's also like an Asian violence large thing black going on in the background. Like large native black population in, in uh, UK, like that's been there for a long time. Like they've had a lot of that as well, right? So it, yeah. it makes sense for them to feel that way as well. And if you're familiar with Engli or English history and European history a little bit more than I think the average bearer, it really breaks down on a religious level, right? It's more Christian versus Muslim than it is these other things, even though the stabbing perpetrator in this case was a Christian. It, it's the uh, culture we'll thing, right? Like it's this, it's similar in Ireland where you have like a lot of people that are like, no, like we want to be Irish and you are just flooding in millions of people to disrupt our entire population. And all of a sudden we're having to like bow to them in some way because of like some grander narrative that exists. On like right? a moral standard level yeah. is what you mean. Yeah, I totally understand. So like this and this kind of suggests that. So here is his response to something that happened in America, the BLM movement and everything around that. I was shocked and angered shocked. at the killing of George Floyd and the response of President Trump and the US authorities to the peaceful protests, to people rightly demanding justice, has been an affront to humanity. The last week has shone a spotlight on the racism, discrimination and injustice experienced by those from black and minority ethnic communities in the US in the UK and across the world. Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That's why today I've written to the Prime Minister asking for his assurance that the British government is doing all that it can to urge President Trump to respect human rights and the fundamental democratic right to peaceful protest. And this week, Labour has called on the UK government to ensure that our exports are not being used in the suppression of democratic rights in the US. But we must also reflect on the injustices in our own country. We must address the reality and the impact of anti-black racism, which has been highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, more than ever, it's incumbent upon us all to ensure that this is a turning point. We must 
face up to and understand and address the systemic racial discrimination that exists in our own communities. The Labour Party stands with black communities in our country and across the world because black lives matter. All right, and then how he responded to the protests. This is, this is before much of the counter-protests the first day uh, there were counter protests, but before really the Muslim community. Part Be- before we get into the his, his response to the right wing stuff, like this is just like a useful watch for propaganda stuff. Like when things often get centered around one guy for something like be very careful with that of like your thinking in moments like this, because like, OK, there was one guy that where there was a altercation with officers and this became a global symbol right for across the West over across that points everything in the direction of a very specific group that seems to be like the people in control, right. Mm -hmm. And giving them more power when we also have an America like Chicago is more of a certain areas of Chicago are more of a war zone statistically than Afghanistan, right? There are plenty of just, there are plenty of African Americans in Chicago that are getting killed every day in Chicago, right? And there's not really a concern about that. But when this one instance happened, it became this like perfect global narrative for everybody to use and for for people in the UK to jump on, right? Like that's to say that it's somehow Donald Trump's fault. Like like that's not how our system works, brother. We're not a unitary government. He didn't really have a role here. Like that's not (laughs) just like remember those things when the next when the next thing happens like always remember that and think back to all the other narratives and especially when the internet was way and the social channels were way more censored and how that was used as a control apparatus over top of the narratives yeah so we'll get into and now i'm then how he deals with the uh the far right quote-unquote thugs here and make no mistake whether it's in southport london or hartlepool These people are showing our country exactly who they are. Mosques targeted because they're mosques. Flares thrown at the statue of Winston Churchill. A Nazi salute at the Cenotaph. And so I've just held a meeting with senior police and law enforcement leaders where we've resolved to show who we are. A country that will not allow understandable fear to curdle into division and hate in our communities and that will not permit under any circumstances a breakdown in law and order on our streets because let's be very clear about this it's not protest it's not legitimate so uh we'll keep going but i do want to know that during the blm riots churchill's statue was defaced in london right uh, while America was on fire, this guy stood on a platform and said, like, how dare you repress these peaceful protests? And now that it's in his backyard, he's saying, no, we got to call for law and order and make sure we're not focusing on the systemic injustices, but rather law and order now. This is this is what's happening behind the scenes. If you're really paying attention, you're, it, it, it makes sense why the British right is saying this is insane, right? This 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 standard he's establishing. It's crime, violent disorder. I can announce today that following this meeting, we will establish a national capability across police forces to tackle violent disorder. These thugs are mobile. They move from community to community. And we must have a policing response that can do the same. Shared intelligence, wider deployment of facial recognition technology Uh and preventative action there's a lot criminal behavior orders to restrict their movements before they can even board a train pre-crime shit today now they're doing pre-crime they say we're going to recognize where you are track where you are if you're part of you know the raw group and then make sure you can't go to places (laughs) it's minority report right there it's crazy (laughs) like he just says that like if you just if you just took that latter half and you put it into a different context, a different moment with BLM. He sounds like a radical right winger talking about a group of people moving community to community to stir up violence and hate and division. It sounds like people talking about Antifa. It's exact same thing. So like they're, 
it, it, notice that it, it has little to do with the principle and everything to do with the allegiance to a particular tribe. And what the right's noticing is that their tribe is not with the people from England. It's like, and what's going on there? Why don't, why don't you care about this? And it's one of these things, and this is going to be my weekly quota of ragging on libertarians. Um, <laughs> where, uh, where, cause I, I remember when the summer of love was happening yeah. and it was back when I still was allowed on social media. Um, <laughs> And I was very critical of the Summer of Love and the BLM riots at the time. And I was often getting bombarded with uh, with libertarians being like, oh, do you not like criminal justice reform? <laughs> and like this was the thing, right? Like, like, no, you, you are getting captured at the time. There was a lot of people that were getting captured by the BLM stuff and and they were not and they were falling for the propaganda like now four years later we have the hindsight and we're like yeah that was a crazy time right yeah. but like most people at the time people that should be like against the defacing of property and cities being burning <laughs> were being like no this is a good moment for criminal justice reform to happen <laughs> you know like, well, like that was the <laughs> and, and, there, and it was true that there was there was all of a sudden momentum for an issue area but it's way too it's way too I'm interested in a very narrow thing, which is public policy reform, not like the culture, not like which, the society, in the meantime, not like the things that which matter. In the meantime, like a year or two before that, Trump was signing into law with Kim Kardashian, massive criminal justice yeah, reform. Yeah. And it's like, no, it worked there, but like this is a different thing that's happening <laughs> yeah, right. now. <laughs> like, right. It, it's just it's just a missing forest through trees sort of thing. Um, yes. And then we had Nigel Farage, who was also blamed for the riots by the left uh, responding. Uh, and this is a clip of a larger response, but I think it's a good one. All this peace and love that we hear from those on the left simply isn't true. The prime minister has misread this completely and utterly just to call out the actions of the far right is to misunderstand two things. Firstly, let's be clear, there were masked Muslim extremist mobs, some with weapons, going around the streets of Midlands and northern cities, threatening journalists, journalists literally running away. Indeed, in some cases, people even having their tires on their cars slashed. So of course, as with every major conflict in life, there is fault, serious fault on both sides. But behind the extremes of both, what Starmer doesn't understand, and when he says, I'm going to stop the far right, what he doesn't understand is the general feeling of dissatisfaction that has been out there in this country growing for years. I talked in the general election about societal breakdown. What I meant by that were communities being split apart, people not even recognizing the centers of some of our towns and cities as even being vaguely English anymore. And when it comes to the issue of two-tier policing, something which Keir Starmer denies, I promise you this perception began back at the time of Black Lives Matter. Remember Churchill's statue being defaced, the cenotaph being abused in central London, and the police response? They knelt down in the street and took the knee to a Marxist organization that wants to bring down Western civilization. And it goes on and on from there. Compare the policing to the riots in Leeds with the policing that happened at Southport. And look. Yeah. So you know that what I just noticed on his desk. Have you guys seen uh, 007, the more recent ones with. Uh... Seen some, not all. Why? He's he's got the same uh, little British bulldog that M has <laughs> that James Bond hates, right there. See how you can yeah, see I don't, like I don't the, see. right right below your yep. Right oh, below that's your what mouth. that is. Yeah, it's little <laughs> oh. British bulldog <laughs> from Double <007. laughs> <laughs> huh. oh, Seven. All right, sorry. It's probably a common thing <laughs> in, in the UK, right? Like yeah. they're like. <laughs> that's funny and and I, I, I another part of this that is interesting is the sentencing here i mean how fast the uk governments move on sentencing you got guys in days mere days being sentenced to three years in jail for rioting very jan sixy and i don't mean requested sentencing or recommended sentencing in the process of vet i'm talking about they are being sentenced already that is in <sighs> 
in government terms, that is light years fast. That is milliseconds. That's kind that of so what happened with Jan Six. Is like everything got snappy. It was yeah, very snappy. Well, well, yeah, and long in the same time. But it, that's like grabbing a bullet out of the out of air uh, in government time. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Daily Mail, you son of a gun. Um, so this is part, of, and the other narrative that came out is the misinformation narrative. Obviously, kind of coming in from the uh, left saying, well, what really caused this and the central cause isn't the, um, isn't the alternative narrative, which is the systemic voice of the unheard. It was that the wrong information got put out on the internet in an immediate response to this horrible tragedy and it was picked up by major figures, one of those major figures being Andrew Tate, who tweeted out that it was uh, 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 an undocumented migrant who did it. That's, that's not Andrew oh, Tate. Oh, so cute. That's not, that's not Andrew Tate. Oh, look at that little bulldog. That's the bulldog that, that he was referencing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and, and that it was a Muslim. So one of the things is like, why are the mosques being attacked? Why are these migrant centers being attacked? Well, because of the this internet meme that's spread on the internet. And it is true that there were lots of people who immediately jumped to a conclusion, including Andrew Tate, who put out false information. Uh, that said, most of those narratives were immediately corrected when the government released the guy's information, right? They didn't have that information. Then the guy, government whoop, put out who it was, uh, and we could immediately get to the truth. Um, the This is, uh, of course, another one of the big platforms for the more corporate media to stand on to say, see, look, that's why you need an editorial board to make sure we don't make these mistakes and why we need to censor the internet. Because yeah, they never make mistakes on those editorial so, boards. <laughs> what turned out to be true is that he is from a Christian family. And, and I want to note, our podcast got this right, right? From a Christian family from Africa and a second generation documented migrant, but who did come through an asylum program, um, from from that from that situation um but they they lived a relatively middle class life um and you know were known in the local church community and things like that as well so what happened what took that kid from there to stabbing little girls that, that's the one thing we don't know and that's what causes this societal angst as well is when you don't know when mm -hmm. you don't have uh, the the manifesto the thing the thing that explains it so that you can identify the mind virus problem there was he on sris SSRIs. Like, we don't know. We don't know anything about this guy. Um, and then another one is uh, Elon Musk. And I'll just mention this quickly because it was a, a pretty major uh, <laughs> narrative arc in the misinformation thing was places like the Daily Mail and the Guardian attacking X specifically as the origin of this Elon Musk responding and then getting into a, a tit for tat with the UK prime minister over whether or not X is sufficiently controlling misinformation. Well, well, there's also a, a thing with that, too, where um, Elon has been saying that it appears that Europe is heading towards civil war. He's been he's tweeted that yeah. out a few times. Yep. And it's funny, just like all the Elon haters are just like, why is Elon trying to instigate a civil war? <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> it's such a frustrating narrative that I've seen pop up. And it's just like, no, Elon's not trying to instigate. He's just warning like there's all the symptoms in place. It's like saying like. Oh my God, like people complaining about, oh my God, the US economy is going to collapse and people being like, and, and saying it's like, it's because the US deficit is so crazy high. And then them being like, why are you trying to instigate a, <laughs> US, like an economic collapse? <laughs> like it's so crazy. It, and it was interesting from the kind of Western, like international media perspective, there was a time period where it was actually hard to get information on what was going on in London because everyone was talking about Elon and the UK prime minister having a, an internet fight, mm -hmm. right? That got more coverage at certain junctures. So Obviously, that was a, uh, and then, and then additionally, that one last thing, we have all the stories that have trickled out out of London since 2020 about people basically, you know, being prosecuted by the police for internet speech, right? So you have this underlying angst about that saying, okay, you can't talk about this unless you have a legal liability to talk about this unless you do that. And what part of this was the Daily Mail actually tracked down one of the first people to speculate online that he was a Muslim. Uh, that then that, that wasn't Andrew Tate. Uh, he didn't mention anything about that. This lady, regular lady, uh, was tracked down by the Daily Mail, went to her door and got a quote from her. And she's like, well, I'm horrified that, you know, that I was wrong about that. But I'm really worried about these kids that got killed. You know, like, like, yeah, that's kind of the, the point. So, um, and, and, and so the other like core narrative is what I call the systemic analysis 
you know, view, which is the voice of the unheard narrative, like where, what is the motive of these protests and these riots and how do we interpret this? And if you look at the way Sturmer talked about BLM is now how Andrew Tate and other folks who are on the right. And, and I want to be clear here why we're talking about Andrew Tate here. One, he's an immensely influential internet figure who has an audience as big, if not larger than CNN in some ways, right? Like he, I, I, can, he was the most Googled person ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he is actually, his identity is actually the perfect person for this. He's biracial. He's an immigrant to the UK, right? He's not, he wasn't born there. He was yeah. he's American a, immigrant though. Like it's not like, you know. yeah, exactly. But that's still like, he's, he's an outsider yeah. in the UK. Half black, half white. Right. Uh, lived, lived in Luton, which is like one of the poorest areas of England. Yeah. Where, where uh, Tommy Robinson's from is Luton. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Massive Islamic population in Luton as well. He himself is a convert to Islam. Right. So like there's a lot in there where he has a very particular narrative here. So uh, he he got on with Piers Morgan uh, this week and had an interview, a very frustrating interview. Um, I put out a tweet that said Piers Morgan is the is the most unique journalist in that he is the one who asked the most questions of his guests, but also is completely uninterested in hearing what his guests say <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> but- Piers is an interesting <laughs> figure because he's like kind of become like the guy that hosts all the Internet people like but he's also kind of. He's, he's also one of those guys where he's like right about things five years too late. Like, yeah. like he's, he's like, it's very weird. And, and like what I do appreciate thing. that he does try to really have his own perspective on things while he does all the traditional media techniques to try to get good quotes out of people and to create heat in yeah. the interview that really oh, he's, like he's frustrate. Good at, he's good at clip farming. Like yes. he's really good at clip farming. Yes. So this is a uh, part of that as uh, I think uh, Tate does a pretty good job uh, describing the voice of the unheard as applied to this particular circumstance. Well, first things first, it's unfair for you to say that I've had an opposite effect. What I did was point out the facts of the situation that a 17-year-old male killed little girls. If I point out the facts of the situation that the sky is blue, and then people go and decide to riot because I've said those things, it does not mean those things are not true. That's the first thing. Secondly, here's where we have the dichotomy of the UK, and I actually think this conversation is going to be one of the most important and potent conversations of modern times, especially as this issue is not going to be solved anytime soon, Piers. The problem we have now in the UK is that We have a certain subsect of the population who believe because he was born in Cardiff, he is a Welsh man. And we have another subsect of the population who believe that even if he was born in Cardiff, he is not Welsh. I'm currently in Romania. I'm an American and British citizen. The woman who I have a child with is Italian. The child was born in Romania. The Romanians do not consider that child Romanian, not by their view of the world. If I had a child in China, they would not consider that kid Chinese. They would look at the face shape of the child and say, that's not a Chinese child. If I had a black child in Russia, they would not consider that child Russian. In the West, in the democracies, we do. But we have a problem because you now have two, you have a dichotomy of ideas, you have two different camps, and the camp that believe that this person perhaps isn't even Welsh in the first place are also the camp which are being suppressed and not allowed to speak and are being smeared and labeled as far right for having genuine concerns. And that is why things are getting exasperated and out of control. What we need is conversation and what we need is dialect. You cannot have a multicultural democracy and ignore the concerns of one particular subsect of that culture, especially when it's the native culture, and expect everything to be fine forever. There's a lot of people who have a point of view. They didn't feel like they had a political solution anymore. And this is what's happening. The reason this dichotomy exists, Piers, please understand, if they are sitting there and they're accepting that this is a Welsh man, but now they're starting to get concerned for the safety of their children, and they don't feel like there's any kind of political solution, well, then they're going to come to the very simple and obvious conclusion that they'd rather not have anyone from anywhere else in their country to avoid these things happening again because they don't feel like there's any other political solution. This is a fail of the politicians. This is a failure of the leaders. It is the job of a leader to inspire all of the people to have trust in him, not just some of the people, not just the people he likes, not just the people on his party or the people he wants. It is his job as a leader to have every single person in the country believe that he cares about the issue and he's doing something actively to fix it. Instead, what Keir did was stand up and do the absolute opposite. Shut down any legitimate concerns. Tell people they don't have a voice. Tell people nothing's going to change is going to stay exactly the way it is. And let me tell you something. I want to make this very clear. There's a lot of people in the world who would rather go to jail and have a warm bed and three square meals a day than watch their children die. There's a lot of people who would rather go to jail than watch their society collapse in real time around them. There's a lot of people who would really rather go to jail than feel unsafe to walk the street at night ever again. These are people who have lived in the same place for a very long time. They have a vested interest in this geographical location. And without political solutions being offered, 
I don't know how hubristic you must be to sit and expect anything other than what we've seen. This is stop there. That that is a very good distillation of what I've seen from a lot of different perspectives on this situation. Now, note that this is the voice of the unheard. These are people who don't feel like they can speak publicly about these ideas, and so they take to the streets. Uh, and I, I think if you pattern this onto the American political experience, this is exactly the way that they were talking about BLM not too long ago. So what is it? Do we really care? When do we apply systemic analysis and when do we apply, you know, that there uh, individual analysis, right? That bad people sometimes do bad stuff, right? You have a group of a crowd and there's some people there who are, you know, provoking this. Um, that don't mean in the government provocateur sense right now what i mean is i'm a radical right winger i'm a literal nazi and i'm here to spark violence because i want racial hatred because i think that accelerates my political agenda there are some people who are like that who are at these events um and maybe even groups of them right uh who are going area to area like the prime minister said the question is do you cast the entire event like that is this a mostly peaceful protest in the american dialect or is this a legitimate concern of a people who feel overlooked by their government. When do we apply that? Mm -hmm. That's an open question. I think, and it's, it's strange. I think if we could get on the area where we're saying, okay, that's a way of thinking about it, but there are others. And so let's talk about each one. We'd be in a much healthier dialogue as actually getting to solutions. Um, the, the, the other, yeah, obviously the competing narratives to that, that these are all far right thugs, Islamophobic, people who just hate dark skinned people, they are racist, et cetera. And then, and then lastly, you got people who are navigating this issue with some more subtlety. This is not helped uh, by what is clearly, and this is once ago, some of the most interesting evidence of an age of evocateur uh, that is probably working from the police from within one of the right wing protests. And if you go to the video here, Kyle, uh, you notice the guy, actually look at the picture on the right first. Look for this guy in the tank top backpack. Look for him in this video and watch his head and watch the police on the bottom right hand corner when they make eye contact. Here, let me... So keep watching that guy. See that hand signal? He like tips his head. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah. So. What is that? Yeah, that's interesting. That is a very interesting... And, and you know, when you you see that, you kind of think... Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. <laughs> that's exactly what you think. <laughs> um, let's, what's this tweet? Uh, There's been fed plants placed among the British protesters, and here one of them gets caught in plain sight, signaling to the police officer and the officer responding. Same guy was visible during anti-lockdown COVID protests. And you can see there's a black camera and others amongst the white British population. But the media will tell you that these far right extremists are beating any black person they see on the streets. That's just not true. Their own officers are doing this to tarnish the image of these amazing patriotic. Oh, there's, there's, there's some conjecture. A there, little but. bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's what. OK, so an agent provocateur is someone who in plain street clothing is associated with police either by as an informant or outside the police or within the police who is amongst a crowd for a purpose. Now, if you ask uh, the FBI <laughs> or uh, the police in uh, the United States about this is, is to say to get information about who's really driving this thing. This is our informant. This is our person to actually help us prosecute the bad actors on the other side of this. You have the question of, okay, so if you're infiltrating and especially with all of the examples that we have, at least in America, I don't know about the UK, but at least in America of the kind of setups that happen around this in order to fund the police or fund the FBI by empowering these bad actors with resources and knowledge and stuff like that. You have a, you, you, the action is in the reaction. No, no, I did. I said the thing. That's the podcast. All right. The action is in the reaction, right? It's a human reaction. <laughs> and this is, <laughs> and this is from rules for radicals. Mm hmm. Right. What you want to do is create the response that then gets most of the attention, right? So your attention's no longer on the little girls. It's on the riots. 
if you you place the provocateur in there in order to gin up, we need to go into the Capitol. What, what was the cat's name in a, in America that the they uh, did the whole sixty yeah, minutes thing I'm, on? I'm spacing on his name. I got his face in my head. Yeah, uh, former, I, I know what he looks Marine, like. I, I know um, I know who you're talking about. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. people that know. It's know. a great example. Uh, where he's sitting there saying, we need to go in the Capitol tomorrow. We got to go in the Capitol tomorrow on camera in several different He's like on a literal soapbox saying it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Who is that? You know, and, and people's interest in that is because that action became way more important and a way bigger part of the dialogue as Jan 6th than the actual complaints that people had about the insecurity of our elections, all the insanity in 2020, all those sorts of things. Well, well and that's the thing is like ma- when major events happen, one of the first things that you should be thinking about is that there's probably some level of Intel ops in here and, and it could be working domestically. It could be foreign. It could be whatever is it that goes back to our meme. Yeah. It, it, I was actually <laughs> just about to go back and pull that because when I, for saying that, because it's very true, like, Oh my God, everyone's a fed, but, um, but you should be wary of that. Like when major historical events are happening, like, Intel boys are not doing their jobs if they're not involved in it. Right? Like, like that's kind of their jobs is to be involved in it. And if you think a lot of these things are purely natural and there's not instigation that's happening, like you got to kind of like reframe your thinking around these things because that's very common. Like even just back at, you know, how, 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 how big the, uh, the, uh, Intel influence was going on during the civil rights movement with, with MLK jr. And you know, all this stuff, right? Like, all that's there in history. And it's not like that's not happening with the things happening in current day, right? Right. And I want to make it clear. And I know that what you're saying is you're describing the situation as it is. This is how we've built the job descriptions mm-hmm. of these agencies and organizations. This isn't an ought. That's not how it ought to be, but that's how it is. This is the reality. So get in the reality, <laughs> which is that this happens. Like, because so many people are like, oh my God, that sounds so conspiracy, cultural nonsense. It's just like, read history. All of history is conspiracies. Right? Like it's... <laughs> So uh, I, I'm going to actually skip past the last uh, last uh, one of the last stories yeah, yeah, here yeah, just was... because we're going long. Uh, but it is important to know at the exact same time all this is happening, the exact same time people are saying Islamophobia is this huge national problem. It's completely irrational. Taylor Swift just had three shows canceled after Vienna police uh, foiled an attack from a 19 year old man who's Austrian. <laughs> by the Andrew Tate definition, maybe not Austrian, uh, <laughs> to have pledged an oath of allegiance to the Islamic State group to bomb at a, a Taylor Swift concert. So like this, this, these are still things happening that are, you know, if you're a Swifty, all of a sudden you might all of a sudden be realize, oh, wow, the Islamic threat is still there. <laughs> uh, and if you're in the UK, you're saying in Luton or these other places, if you're the Tommy Robinson type, you're saying, hey, this is a this is a dangerous ideology I should be able to talk to, but in order to do that, I'm going to get classified as a violent criminal and get detained uh, just for my speech on this. What do you do? Where do you go? Well, you might go to the streets. T- Taylor Swift canceled because of an Islamic attack. Time to go to war with Iran. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's actually not in our notes today. We should have covered that. Well, it actually kind of plays into, cause yeah, we, we're going long. So we'll kind of uh, touch on this final yep. subject here, but uh, something that happened was markets went in turmoil uh, because of the Japanese market just crashed their, uh, their stock market just went crazy low, but it also came in with, Iran war narratives. And there was a lot of things that was kind of fueling the crash here. But um, essentially what happened is let me actually pull up an image here is uh, this is what the market looked like. Um, so Nikkei, Nik- Nikkei is, is there. It's like their, their stock exchange. Um, it just plummeted turmoil, massive turmoil. And then 24 hours later, just went right back to where it was. <laughs> like, um, but what was the provoking incidents that would cause that? So the pr- provoking incidents is what's called a reverse carry trade. And there was essentially $20 trillion in yen that was tied up in arbitrage trading because you could bar, you could effectively borrow yen at 0% interest. Mm. And then people were taking out loans on other currencies and then they were getting the interest on other currencies and it became this thing. And then there was like a quarter point rate hike and the the value of the yen went up. And you essentially what you're doing is like, it's kind of like you're shorting it in this arbitrage trade. So the, so the value of the yen went up in compared to the loan. So the margin call comes and and, dumps and, then, it. and then dumps everything. Right. Mm. So there was just this massive market failure that happened and then it spread across global markets. You had um, pretty much, 
you had most stock exchanges kind of like in America too. They like canceled for 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Like markets were closed down and it was a very scary thing. And then I, I just remembered, I remembered the next day because ja- Japanese markets were or at night. It was like 8 p.m. or something like that. All of a sudden I just see on Twitter, it was like, oh, the market's back up. <laughs> you know, like, and it's just that quick thing. But it put up a lot of speculation, had a lot of people worried because there was concerns about an attack that was happening. A lot of politicians were talking about it and it was the mm. same time frame. So this was like Sunday night for us. It would have been Monday morning for Japan. I believe that's how the time frame works. So it was like a bloody Monday there and everybody's like looking at it like, well, Lockheed Market Martin's stock, stock is skyrocketing. <laughs> and, and this is the um, same time that uh, Lindsey Graham introduces a resolution to do an authorization of force against Iran, not for... Israel or any of that stuff for attempting to create nuclear weapons. There, there, there was a <laughs> lot of that they've been accusing Iran of doing since the 1980s. Yeah. BB just keeps saying like, they're like two years away and they've been two years away for like 30 years. <laughs> um, but, but it, it became a lot of this thing where there was a lot of shock and a lot of uh, people being like, Oh, we're going into a bloody Monday. Like what are American markets going to look like? Well, a lot of the stock exchanges were closed. Um, because of these events and the the kind of contagion that was being spread through it. But then there was also a lot of like, are the markets getting ahead of schedule on potential World War Three like movement? Uh, you know, are we going to war, a war in Iran? Is there some, some suggestion of like maybe China activity with Japan? Mm. Like there was a lot of that type of speculation that was circulating online. Mm. And, you know, especially like the crypto space was going crazy because those markets aren't regulated in the same like you know it's not like oh you can only trade for eight hours five days a week you know it's not that type of stuff right so like the crypto markets were going crazy and poly market like the prediction markets were going crazy so there was just a lot of volatility that was happening but it was um i can't remember the numbers i don't have the numbers offhand but it was like like a trillion or two trillion dollars wiped out from leverage Whoa. like across the market at the time. So just like if you Yikes. were depending on where your positions were, like you got wiped, like it was wow. a pretty like we're talking um, we're talking uh, COVID levels of wiped yeah. for people like when the stock market crashed in March of 2020 from the COVID crash, um, like we're talking on that level of wipage. How much of this is is a proof positive of kind of the perverse incentives of central banking from the Japanese perspective? They've had low interest rates since the 1990s. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> like basically zero. And so I, what I assume is a lot of people were saying they have low interest rates and, they're, and they've had it for three decades. So therefore, they're probably going to have it for longer. So I'm going to take a position that allows me to leverage that fact and bet against and, and bet that that's going to continue. And when that no longer continued, because the central bank set woke up that day and said, well, let's raise interest rates a little bit. It had this huge... Well, effect. that's the crazy thing. Like in America, you know, we have the uh, FOMC and like you have like j Powell coming out every once in a while and everybody's just like waiting on pins and needles. Is he going to use the word dove? Is he going <laughs> to use the word? You know, like, yeah, right. like what words is he using? And then markets are just like, wow, <laughs> just depending on what one guy says in a press conference. Right. And you're just like, <laughs> like, what are we like this? This doesn't feel sustainable. Like this does not feel like how a functioning society should work. Right. right? <laughs> it is interesting too. The other the other part of that, um, just talking normatively about it, the fact that you you shut down your market so that people can't reposition, right? In in given new information, except for in the crypto markets, right? Mm-hmm. So people are actually doing. It's kind of like it, maybe this is a bad analogy, but I, I, I let me let me go off script, not script, but just let me go loose here. Whole for thing a scripted. <laughs> no, it is not. Bennett's, you're giving, it, it Bennett's giving our lines as in we the, speak. In the ears. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, shut up, Dave. What do you think this is for? <laughs> is there an analogy between like corporate press being like the stock market and crypto being like X, right? Where the dialogue adjusts faster on X, right? You make the initial mistake of someone puts out a tweet and it goes super viral on the person being a migrant, but then it corrects itself within a very quickly and we get new information very quickly, yeah. but it has tremendous real world effects, right? So it has that liability, but it has the asset of being able to immediately fight against propaganda and th- that sort of thing. But it has the the vulnerability of the opposite of, vol- of vol- volatility. Like yep. it's a it's a bet that the risk of more free speech will result in long run, 
much like uh, a more risky investment. Short, short run is chaotic. Like right. it's all hell, which I mean, if you look at crypto markets compared to normal markets, like it's the same thing. Short run, run you're just like, you're you're seeing 50% upswings, 50% downswings, like in mm. very quick momentum. But in the long run, like everything's up and to the right in general, if you're just in like kind of the blue chip assets. Or, or you, could make, you could make the example of like prediction markets versus polling, right? Mm. Poly, poly market has become a thing that just everybody is just generally looking at and they're sharing online like of what the current prediction markets of things work. Um, predict it kind of had this in the 2020 and 2016 elections. It was kind of like this, but it wasn't quite the same thing with poly market. Like it is actually a crypto run market, uh, where you are trading polygon tokens on poly market, like, which is a layer two of Ethereum, And people are actively like the news and the percentages of like Biden dropping out, uh, of the race and, um, and, like the poll numbers of Trump, like it shows actual, it's like a market phenomenon showing public sentiment in real time faster than polls are doing. Mm. And they're, and they, they see are seemingly becoming more accurate than polls. Like, like we knew based off of poly market prediction polls that Biden was dropping out before like mainstream press was talking about it. Like it, it just became painfully aware if you were just watching it. Right. Right. So uh, I think part of the, part of people that might not be getting about prediction markets, the degree that they're utilitous because they demonstrate actual stake in the game mm -hmm. as opposed to what do you call, what do you call somebody like, how do you feel about the economy? How do you feel about Joe Biden? People are just kind of giving their general sentiments. They don't lose anything of the wrong, but if you're in the, in a prediction market, if you're wrong about whether or not Joe Biden's going to drop out, you'll lose money. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's a truer measurement of a subset of the population's views. And it usually probably in this, it's the most informed subset of the population, how they're viewing other phenomena. So it's like a secondary order signal on how a certain set of, uh, of how the larger social order is thinking about an issue. Well, and that, that's kind of the thing, like, cause a lot of people will criticize like in the moment, what somebody says on X versus what somebody might be saying on X about an event a week later. Like right. those, those like beginning moments, especially around like, let's say the Trump assassination attempt. Um, like I was very glued to Twitter that entire night while it was happening. And like, we, we, we showed my, my tweet that Liam leaked online <laughs> of, or sorry, my, 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 my text message, um, what that Liam put online. Um, that got, got quite big numbers and you're welcome, Liam. <laughs> I'll send you more text messages. Um, but, but like that was kind of my head of where I was seeing of just like kind of filtered information an hour, an hour and a half in. And it was largely correct. Like the things I got wrong was like the yardage by like mm -hmm. 20 yards of right. this stuff. When we still get um, weird reports about that. You yeah. Know, 130. Well, even then, like, like my, my number of shots fired was actually correct. The, mm -hmm. the things that reported for like a week after was wrong. And now we have gone back to what my original thing was. Mm -hmm. But like, it's one of those things where in the moment, like there's tons of stuff going around and everybody's just kind of throwing information at the wall. And then we start to parse it through it. And there's like this active hive mind organism of news that is formulated around that. Mm. And that to me is way more trustworthy of like this decentralized model than just being like, what is the AP required statements about X thing? Right. You know, like that's a very different. And I think that's, that's like a proof of the way to think about centralization and decentralization of why, um, more freedom, more free markets, why more decentralized ways of doing things has risks, inherent risks, but has inherent assets of lack of central control so that you can make those adjustments quickly and get to the truth quickly or get to, you know, more allocated, more rationally allocated markets and things like that. Yeah. And uh, we'll, um, we'll, actually be talking a bunch about the uh, X boycott lawsuit of, with advertisers in the skiff as well. Yeah. So we'll be talking a little bit more about X because it is one of those things where the X phenomenon, and it's one of those things where like the biggest problem with X is like, it's actually still not decentralized enough. Like I, I actually think that there's steps forward on the social media technology that will make it even better. And we're just still not there yet. Like mm. we're still in the old way of doing social media. It's just right now it's like Elon's more trustworthy than the previous, you know, problems and that we have competitors media, largely right, right? Yeah. facebook and places like that all right well uh and last on our stories before we get to the skiff uh and our members only is rfk jr signs on to defend the guard so we're winning ending on a white pill now why is this important uh, this is a boy, Liam, who's uh, really been leading the defend the guard push in uh, montana and across you know the united states in a lot of ways 
RFK Jr. doing this is a signal that this issue of defend the guard is, you know, going to the mainstream is being pushed into like, Hey, if you are at all interested in a more restrained foreign policy, more sensible, reasonable foreign policy, this is a good way that you can from your state level, make a difference in that foreign policy. Well, And, and what is defend the guard? It is, um, it, uh, makes it so that National Guard does not get sent out unless there's a declaration of war, right? So, like, so overseas will probably deployment. support this. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> um, which which is also like it kind of gives. He more, should though. I mean, given his actions, yeah. yeah. But, but, but it, it's it's also a thing like you know gives more power to the states. Yeah. Governors get to control their National Guard much more, which is kind of how it's supposed to be. You know, we're not just like sending your National Guard folks over to fight in Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. right? Or, or Iran. Or, or, or Iran <laughs> or whatever. Right. right. And, and a big part of this was uh, obviously just in the history real quick was d in, during the GWAT, uh, there was a substantial amount. Global war on terror. Oh, sorry. Hey, you were doing all kinds of acronyms earlier. <laughs> um, during the global war on terror and when that was the major push, there was a... There was a lot of instances where there would be real emergencies and problems on the ground in the United States, but they couldn't be addressed by the National Guard, such as fires and floods and stuff like that, because they were deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan or someplace across the Middle East. So th this sort of uh, bottom up Tenth Amendment based solution is, is I, I know, in a lot of ways, a push exactly in the right direction, especially given the degree to which these large international and national issues are really difficult to affect without scale, right? Uh, without enormous, enormous scale and persuading the people in the middle, right? Where you can persuade the people in the middle on the local level and the state level and get these, uh, these, uh, legislation, legislation like this passed. I, I would suspect, I would suspect, uh, Trump would sign on to this too in the future. I, I imagine people I, I are would, working I would on suspect that. that. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. if you, if you can get a Trump endorsement to defend the guard, if that happens, that's going to be another enormous win and a way that Trump can pull over more RFK junior votes, which is another big reason why this is a huge deal oh, because there's you no way that? Kamala Harris does it. I'll, I'll talk to Trump tonight yeah. um, about it. Or, or maybe if I can talk to Don Jr. about oh, it. Oh yeah. You're going to be at the Trump rally. Yeah. Aren't gonna, you? yeah he, as we're filming this, Trump is coming to Bozeman uh, this evening and uh, I, um, I have kind of like backstage passes or like expedited VIP access or something. Ooh. I don't know what that actually means. Um, actually, what I what I would like to do, I would like to talk to Don Jr. about the crypto stuff he's about to do. <laughs> <laughs> he has a big announcement coming that he's uh, th that him and Eric have been teasing. Um, so, but keep, maybe I get to shake the orange man's hand. Yeah, we'll see. keep keep an eye on our social medias if we can get some video from those. I get it from Kyle's phone or whatever. We're gonna have some interesting fun some at the rally. Leaked video from Kyle's phone. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, he, Liam's gonna be there too, so maybe oh, I'll okay, run into yeah, him. But yeah. he, he'll be kind of more in the crowd stuff. Like I'll be in the um, the fancy people section. Ooh. I actually have no idea. I have no idea. So like, high class. The the Republican Party of Montana seems to be very. Uh, um, not prepared for this and I don't really know what is entailed with my, with my special ticket because <laughs> all the information they've given me is just like the normie person and stuff so I don't uh, like I was I'm supposed to be able to like be able to go in through the back door but like all the information is just like yeah you get in line with the, you know it's like well that's not what my pet like, so yeah. the GOP in Montana just does not seem ready for whatever this is oh, it's, it's gonna so. be huge it's gonna be it's for a while I, I can't imagine I can't really remember another circumstance of a uh, actively running president on a ticket coming to Montana other than Obama in his well, off year election, well, which he was so Trump, Trump came uh, in 2020. He, he did a rally in Bozeman in 2020 at the airport. 2022. Was it 20? Yeah. You're not thinking of 2020. He's no, it was 2020. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it was 2020. I don't think so. No, no, I think it was 2022. Oh no, you're right. You're right. He did with Steve Danes. Uh, in yeah, you're right. You're yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So these are, yeah, no, cause uh, like it, it was definitely, cause I'm thinking about who was working where in politics. Well, in both cases. I remember. No, yeah, that wasn't right. That's not right. No, I don't think that's right. Yeah. I, I don't know. 20, it doesn't I think matter. it's 2018 and 2022, not, not 2020. Um, yeah, because that would have been COVID. So maybe yeah. it was 2018. Yeah, it's probably 2018. It was 2018 when uh, Rosendale was running for the Senate against Tester. Yeah. He came to Montana quite a few times, which is well, zero and, cost, I, and I remember right? him zero being like, Gene Forte, he's really body slamming them. You know? yeah. like, I remember him making yeah, uh, body yeah. slammer jokes. Yeah, exactly. So it was probably 2018. <laughs> don't get, don't because, get Greg because, angry. That's that, what he said. That happened, yeah. in 2017, that happened in 2017. Yeah, right. So anyways, we're getting a lot of Montana stuff here. But yeah, that's uh, that's going to be happening. Hopefully we get some good content for you guys. So thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, it was another crazy week. We barely made it through without Joe. We need our 
organizer in chief to keep us on track, but I think we did okay. It was, it was a fun podcast. We did fine. Appreciate it so much for your time. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and if you want to keep on listening, we got some great information coming up in the skiff. That is our secured area for members only, where we talk about the stuff that we obviously are going to get demonetized for if we do anything else. So, all right, we'll catch you there. Peace. Thanks for tuning in to Human Reaction. Please be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and give us a review on your podcast platform of choice. And if you want to become a member and support the show financially, check out humanreactionpod.com. And remember... Welcome back to Human Reaction, motherfucker! <laughs>